this is a great topic tonight. Cholesterol is something that really affects all of us. It, it affects us and is one of the leading factors in the largest death rate in the United States, which is cardiovascular disease. And that's really been brought to my attention lately as I've uh, purchased a scanner that's, that helps me now see the amount of, of placking within the arteries and uh, overall strength of the heart. And now knowing what Innovita carries, um, and we'll discuss this tonight, this is such a great way for you to support your patients in their diminishing of plaque within their arteries from cholesterol, dropping the cholesterol levels in their, in their blood, and helping to cause more elasticity in the arteries is just tremendous. So tonight is a very, not that any of the other mini seminars have, aren't important, but this one is the leading cause of death, cholesterol and cardiovascular. So this is a great picture that Brent's included here of, a, of what an artery would look like. And then here, here's your red blood cells, and that's what's flowing within those arteries and arterioles. And then ultimately, a, a, the, the depiction here of the cholesterol and placking, um, because of irritation to the heart, to the lining of the arteries, cholesterol placking can, can then begin. Um, but to be able to really see it, to know that it's there, and then to provide the opportunity for our patients to get through it and become more healthy, what a great, great thing. Uh, so I've been practicing about 23 years now, coming in June here soon, here in Bountiful, Utah, and I really enjoy coaching others, coaching other doctors, and my own patients. So cholesterol, let's break it down here for a minute. It, it, the etymology, late 19th century origin, Greek chole or bile, and Greek steros or stiff. So stiff bile, if you will, and that's a great way to, to uh, um, explain what that what is what this cholesterol is so we'll read through these uh, these uh, um, slides together and add to them as well so this is what a cholesterol molecule would look like so a sterile or a sterile organic molecule that produces a lipid that is an essential building block of many things in the body including cell membranes when synthesized by the liver it's used in the building of hormones and other parts of the body so it's very important this is a it's a uh, a love-hate relationship, if you will. We need it so much within our system, but if it goes awry, then it can create a placking and so forth within the arteries and we have trouble. So the liver maintains the cholesterol levels in the body. And as we discuss here in a minute, the liver, I like to call it the, the furnace of the body, where the thyroid would be the thermostat. Sometimes with high cholesterol, we have low thermostat levels or low thyroid levels. So we want to make sure that as we, as we work with our patients, we're paying attention to that concept. So the source of cholesterol, significant source it was such as animal fats, dairy, egg yolks. Now, I'm not really sure, I don't, I don't have a, a real strong opinion about what to do here with our eggs. I think we're afraid of, of eating a lot of eggs, and that's true, we shouldn't eat a ton, but now we have, now we have the separation, so we only have egg yolk. Uh, our good friend McDonald's has our, our egg yolk, uh, something or other that you can have just the, not the yolk, but the whites, so we get rid of the yolk. But to me, if I'm going to eat an egg, I'm going to eat it the way nature created, the way God meant it to be. I'm going to eat the whole, the whole part together, and I don't know that it's as big of a problem when you eat it that way. Of course, our beef, the way we process our beef, um, we grow them out in pasture, and in the last six months of life, we send them to the feedlot, feed them full of all kinds of nastiness, and uh, fill them full of steroids to, to beef them up and antibiotics and so forth. I still eat beef. Um, I'm not a vegetarian. I eat beef occasionally, um, but still, it's not as good for us. Pork, of course, is a really tough one. They suggest that pork takes about eight hours to get out of your stomach once you've consumed it. As far as the digestion, it takes that long to, uh, to move through for the body to recognize, yes, we've digested it appropriately enough to pass it in the small intestine. Fish, of course, we have good, you know, our fish is one of the best sources that we have of, of cholesterol and of uh, essential fatty acids. Shrimp, shrimp of course is a bottom feeder. It's actually a quite a yucky little animal. Love it. Sure tastes good with lots of butter. <laughs> of course I draw my butter strong so we don't have all the junk in it. Um, poultry and breast milk, all of it is where is a good source of the cholesterol. So we need it of course and uh, we just need to watch out how much we have of it. The smaller sources would be plants and phyto, phytosterols like flax, nuts, grains, avocados, legumes, 
So this is a more of an effective way. If you can get it from their plant source, your phytonutrients, that's going to be more effective than the animal uh, sources. So good versus bad cholesterol. Cholesterol will not dissolve in the, in the blood and must be transported by lipoproteins through the cardiovascular system. So lipoproteins are very important to transport it to where it needs to be. So of course we have the LDLs and the HDLs. So the LDLs are the low density lipoproteins. We want them to be lower. So LDLs, this is the cholesterol that contributes to the plaque deposits mainly. We need the HDLs. We like to have the higher amounts of HDLs. Considered to be good cholesterol that helps to remove the LDLs or the LDL cholesterol from arteries and, and back to the liver. So when we check our cholesterol, everybody wants it to be below 200, but it's not necessarily the, the amount there, the level of 200. It's more the level of the LDL to HDL ratio. And that's a, a, a process that you can look up. I don't exactly know that ratio, um, but that's something that, that um, I should, but I don't. But that's something you can look up for your own practices as well to know where that best ratio is. Triglycerides, of course, that's something that we, we check when we do an HDL, LDL triglyceride screen. Our triglycerides show up. So this is fat that stores excess energy from your diet and, and basically is the cause, cause by obesity or cause of obesity. So triglycerides um, can, can come up and down more quickly than the, than the cholesterols. So the potential causes of, um, of the plaquing and so forth and high cholesterol, diet, too much saturated fats, being overweight, inactivity. You know, in the winter time we don't do as much activity. It's cold and we're not out mowing the lawn and playing with our, you know, with our neighbors and going on camp trips and things like that. Age and gender. So as we age, of course, the cholesterol has a tendency to come up. Overall health. Just when we're, when, if we've diminished in our overall health, we're going to have a chance to have greater amounts of cholesterol and of LDL. Smoking, leaky gut syndrome, infections, especially those that affect the, the pancreas and the, uh, the, the liver. When we have those kind of layers of infection, it's going to make it so that our liver doesn't synthesize the cholesterol the way that it should. So pancreas, thyroid, and other organ malfunction. So, so we're thinking about pancreas. Well, pancreas produces the uh, digestive enzymes. So if we don't have the appropriate amount of digestive enzyme, we're not going to be able to break the cholesterols down. So lipase is one we'll discuss here in a minute that's vital at, at, at to breaking and synthesizing the cholesterol. Remember we talked about a minute ago, the thyroid is your, um, the thyroid is the thermostat. So we're going to make sure that the thyroid levels, which leads, which ultimately is a major part of the metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome, is when the hypothalamus pituitary ac, uh, ad, ad, adrenal access is, is um, disrupted. So there's an access between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal glands. That when that's down, we end up getting into metabolic dis, uh, syndrome. So we've got hypothala, which we're not going to talk about tonight, but that's a great supplement to support hypothalamic function. And especially when we get into what's called hypothalamitis or an inflammation of the hypothalamus. That messes all of the endocrine system up and then we start into metabolic syndrome. Insulin resistance, this is something that because of the amount of processed foods and things that, that we eat, our insulin levels, we're shooting all the time so we don't have the ability to, our cells become uh, resistant to the, to the tra uh, transportation and deposition of fats within the, through the, through the uh, cell membrane. And then genetics may keep cells from effectively removing LDL cholesterol from the blood or cause the liver to produce too much. So genetics is very important. We can look and see a genetic predisposition for high cholesterols. So the American dilemma, this is what we see very much. Our little, little friend here, you know, sitting there eating his McDonald's uh, French fry and Coke. And we've, we've all seen the Super Size Me video. That's a great one to explain what, what this hardening of this plaquing does. So high cholesterol increases the risk of, of the leading cause of death in the United States is cardiovascular disease. 71 million American adults have high LDLs. That's 33% of the population. Only one out of every three has a condition under control, which we'll see in a pie graph here in a minute. Only one in three have it under control. 
less than half adults seek treatment. Yeah, I've got it, but I'm just going to keep on going. I'm going to bury my head in the sand. Basically, I'm too tired to make a difference. I don't, I, I, I'm trying to get the American dream, and I don't have time to go exercise and eat right and prepare good food. People with high LDLs are twice the risk of cardiovascular disease. That's amazing. So now here's also the race, race and ethnicity as well. Um, our Af African American at 34.4% on men, women at 27%. Mexican Americans 41%. That's that's higher than uh, um, than the African American. I'm and I'm not seeing um, our uh, Native American, but I think that's one of the higher ones that I'm not seeing on here. And non-Hispanic whites at 30%. Overall, at 32.5 percent, so that's 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 an interesting statistic there. On the light side, though, between 1999 and 2010, we've done a pretty good, a pretty good, um, um, at least explaining what cholesterol does, and we're seeing somewhat of a drop here. So the percentage of adults with high cholesterol or total cholesterol decreased from 18.3 down to 13.4, so 5 percent from 1999 to 20. That's still not enough. We're not we're not expressing it enough. So monitoring trends suggest that cholesterol awareness and treatment are up over 10 years ago. So if you look here, the controlled people who have high cholesterol controlled back in 1988 to 94 was 4%. Now we're controlled at 25%. Well, we're controlling it wrong with statins. That's what the control is, pretty much, and 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 diet. But as we see here in a minute, statins just do not do a body good. We've got to do better than that. Statins, we've got to go have the uh, the, the liver enzymes checked to make sure that we're not causing liver death from the statins. You know, every few months we need to check that. Well, heaven's, heaven's sakes, the liver is what's its main job. One of its main jobs is to, to get in and work with that synthesizing of the cholesterol. Aware but not treated, 28%. Now, over here, un, uh, aware, let's see, aware not treated has gone to 37%. Well, that's not too good. Treated but not controlled, 16%. Treated not controlled at 8%. So there's definitely more people aware of it and and doing things about it. It's just in somewhat in the wrong way. Okay. However, many are recommended to take statins and pharmaceutical drugs that have benefits and risks, such as bile acid sequestrants. So that means it it can get in the way of the bile acids, so they they can clog up and actually create more uh, gallstones. Um, cholesterol absorption inhibitors, so you're not absorbing cholesterol. Many statins have well-established side effects, including anemia, sexual dysfunction, cataracts, memory loss, muscle problems, diabetes, and even cancer. So I'm not really interested about that. I don't want to do statins. I want to I want to do diet control, and and cardiar, and a few other things that we can discuss later on as we treat discuss treatment. So lipase and bile are the main digestive components for cholesterol. Lipase comes from um, the pancreas. That's amylase protease lipase. Again, that comes from pancreatic function, which is going to be, well, there's the gallbladder, so pancreas is going to be under, under the stomach here. Um, so the pancreas produces the lipase. That's our, so I think of like lye. You make soap out of lye and fat. That's what they used to make. Um, soap with. So as you think about it, lipase is and, and uh, bile are like our soap to uh, break down the cholesterols and, and fats that we eat. So when the pancreas is overworked, the pancreas creates basically a highly pro from highly processed diets. This reduces the lipase production. So without that, we are going to have trouble in the gallbladder. We're going to have um, more fats accumulating all around the system, and then we're going to have that within the, the, the cholesterols within our arteries. So gallbladder, the gallbladder produces the bile. So gallstones are usually a cause by the liver malfunction and, re and reduces or stops the bile. Interesting, so the statins cause liver troubles. If you have liver troubles, you're going to have problems with gallstones because it's affecting the, the production of the bile. Now you've got less bile to help digest the fats, and now you've got more problem with cholesterol. So it's a funny thing to give the liver something that's going to kill it or cause it major stress for the for the treatment of the problem. That just doesn't seem right to me. So the liver is the furnace to rid, rid or burn the cholesterol and the 
the thyroid is the thermostat. That's a great way to put it. So when you have a low-functioning thyroid, it decreases the metabolism, which means lowering heat and digestion of the cholesterol. So we've always got to think about high cholesterol problems. Is it going to be a thyroid issue as well? So I love this. Don't you love this? Oh, I love ice cream. I mean, how can, we, how can we get rid of our ice cream? But it sure does us bad. A single cup of ice cream has as much cholesterol as 10 donuts put together. If I was going to eat donuts versus ice cream, I would go with the ice cream, just saying. Burger is a huge culprit so far as the high cholesterol levels are concerned. So especially when you think about the high protein with the high carbohydrate, you get maldigestion. So if we're going to eat beef, we should eat it with vegetables. Here you got some tomatoes and lettuce and onions, but you usually have a large amount of patty with it. So not only are what you're eating, but you also have to think about the process of digestion of it. Shrimp and lobster are very high in cholesterol. Of course, they're both bottom feeders. You know, we've got cholesterol high in sausage and salami. Liver, why would you any ever want to eat liver? Liver and onions, go figure. <laughs> but we do, they, we did, but the liver, let's go, let's go eat a swimming pool filter. You know, that's, that's what we're doing with our body. That's a filter system, and who knows what's stuck there. 100 grams of butter contains as much as 215 milligrams of cholesterol. Butter, you got to love it, though, on the popcorn and the toast. But you can you can warm it, and the the, the uh, uh, milk solids and other garbage will drop out of it. So you can clean some of the cholesterol out. Here you go. Now one egg yolk contains as much as 160 milligrams of cholesterol. So it is in there, but there's got to be white around it for some reason. You still need it. Just eat it in moderation. Remember, body still needs cholesterol. Moderation in all things. So our treatment. We want to think about thyroidin to support the, the thermostat. We want to raise the body's metabolism. But go above the thyroid as well to the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. You can look that up on the net and learn more about what that access is about. Um, so thyroidin is where we do there. Liver G is going to support the liver function, liver metabolism, uh, synthesis, digestion, assimilation. Digesta helps very well. Digesta taking digesta on an on an empty stomach as well as with your food. So digesta helps to break down. Um, it has lipase, protease, amylase from plant enzymes. Again, everything that that Intervita uses is all completely uh, vegan. Even the even the capsules are not of gelatin but are of carbohydrate. So digesta helps digest on an empty stomach plaque. On an empty stomach, it'll help digest walls of cysts and walls of uh, parasitic issues. With food, it helps to digest the food. Circulate supports the arteries, veins, venules, arterioles, and repairs the genetic function of those tissues, of those cells. And glastic supports the gallbladder and works, uh, works with softening the gallbladder and softening stones as well. So whenever I do a liver gallbladder flush, these are the two, the, gall the liver G and the glastic are two of the very most important. Um, I really like to circulate though as well to support the arteries. When you're thinking about cholesterol or placking, hardening of the arteries, um, um, what do you call it when you've got the varicose veins, all of those circulate is a tremendous supplement. But here's the, here's the granddaddy and I want you to really get this. Cardiar is amazing and it does some great, great things. Let's just read this here. Cardiar uses the semi-essential amino acid L-arginine and other cofactors to provide multiple benefits to the cardiovascular system. Cardiar relaxes the heart muscles and the muscle cells found within the vascular system, improving circulation and immune response. Cardiar helps to improve circulation through vascular systems that suffer from arterial plaque from cholesterol. So let's talk here a minute. Cardiar is 5,000 milligrams of L-arginine and 1,000 milligrams of L-citrulline, along with other form code essentials that support the heart and, and vessels with, their, with the idea of, of um, genetic support to those cells. Anytime you're discussing an organ system treatment with Innovita, you're talking about supporting the DNA repair and further replication of good healthy cells within that particular organ. So that's why I like to circulate 
because it has form code of arter arteries, arterioles, venules, and veins. That means it's been created in the lab. Genetic um, recreation of the gene replication there in the lab. So as you take form code, it's helping to repair the DNA function within that cell, within that organ. So cells make tissues, tissues make organs. So within Cardiar, you've got 5,000 arginine, 1,000 citrulline. Arginine is a precursor or food for nitric oxide. So the cells, the, ep the epithelial cells of the in inner lining of the arteries are what produce the nitric oxide, these cells here. L-arginine is a precursor to, for these cells to use as food to create nitric oxide. Nitric oxide's function, according to the 1998 Nobel Peace Prize winning for, for the health, suggested that arginine was a precursor that created nitric oxide. The nitric oxide was what created or softened the cells and made the muscles of the arteries less rigid, so the hardening of the arteries was diminished. It also helped to remove placking from the cells from the uh, inside lining of the arteries. It also helped to repair the tissue when there was a, a, a breakage from too much pressure within the arteries. It helps us to support and repair that. And it also overall helps to drop the cholesterol level. That's what the nitric oxide does. So nitric oxide is created by the epithelial cells of the inner lining of the arteries. Cardiar has arginine, which is the precursor or food for these guys to make the nitric oxide. Now that we've got plenty of nitric oxide, the problem is nitric oxide diminishes or goes away, has a half-life of two seconds. So it's gone really quickly. But the L-citrulline makes it so that the, the nitric oxide stays around in the system for up to 24 hours. So now we're tremendously affecting our ability to make that artery soft, to make it so that it is, is working the way that it should, to perfuse the blood more effectively to the brain, to the innermost sanctums of the organs, so that you're going to have less chance of having type 3 diabetes, which is our dementias. That's the new buzzword out there is that type 3 diabetes is a shutting down of the arteries within the, the brain. So think about cholesterol, placking in the brain. Now we've got a, a shutdown, just as we do when we have an issue with, the, with, with um, uh, insulin. So it, it literally burns the tissues, the arteries and arterioles, venules deep in the, in, in the feet, in the eyes, in the hands. So you start to give diabetic neuropathy. Same concept, shutting those, those tissues down within the brain so you're, now all of a sudden you're starting to lose memory and having the dementia. My mom just passed away in October of dementia, and it was not fun to see her just basically slowly, slowly stop. And after a week of not eating and drinking, she, uh, she made the transition. Don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that for my family. Cardiar, um, with the scanner I was mentioning earlier, I can determine what level the person is with placking, how much plaque and, and cholesterol junk they have in their system. So that we can then determine, do we give them one scoop a day, two scoops a day, three scoops a day? We suggest no more than three scoops. That would be 15,000 milligrams of L-arginine. You'd be buzzing with nitric oxide, but it would be tremendous. So then we can watch that levels drop and then, and then decrease them back down to two a day and then ultimately one a day. And I'm going to take one a day for the rest of my life for what it does. I plan to live long and be healthy. You, you might hear and see my obituary. This guy died at 98 in his orchard, tractor still running. He was leaned up against a tree, snoring, and he quit snoring. That's how my obituary to say. I want to live till I die. I don't want to die 10 years earlier and see me in a rest home and then 10 years later die. You see what I'm saying? Cardiar can't say enough about it. Always, always, and you read my book, I, talk, I take a look at everything as far as is there a layer of infection. Has there been something, some kind of parasitic issue that's affected the arteries so that now you've got a, a, a bruise or, a, or, or an irritation and now there's a roughness, if you will, and now you have dip, deposit of plaque. So plaque is like a Band-Aid. So Bactoex for bacteria, Meta-X for metals, Microsite, Paramac for parasites, Fungex, and Viro-X. These are the layers of infection. 
and this is one of the things I always look for with my kinesiology is is there a layer of infection affection affecting that particular organ so roughly and again I always suggest doing your kinesiology determining exactly how much that person needs digest a one capsule four times a day two of them on an empty stomach and two of them with food liver G two capsules of excuse me upon rising and two capsules in the evening empty stomach so that the body has a better chance of absorbing that liver G right up into the system four capsules a day of the circulate thyroidin one to four don't just go off these recommendations always check um, with the cardiar of course you're going to figure that as well you know every every person is different of course and that's why we want to make sure that we always ask kinesiologically muscle testing what's the very biggest thing and and, and as practitioners we're oftentimes afraid to use kinesiology because we don't want to look stupid um, we, you know we don't want to we're already weird being on the natural side of things so I always practice with the patient and I'm just straight up straightforward this is one way we're going to be able to determine where to go first we can do all kinds of testing, lab testing, and we can find out all these wonderful, uh, uh, so let's say we do a complete digestive stool analysis and we find that there's five different layers of infection in the gut. Okay, how are we going to determine which, which one of those infections to treat first? We must use kinesiology, that's my opinion. So, hey, well, you got to ask, but generally speaking, I don't go after layers of infection until the vitality of the patient has been brought up to a level where they can handle it. So I, I would look towards the, the hypothalamic pituitary access first, getting the vitality up, making sure as well that, that uh, the liver is, has the ability to receive the junk that's coming its way as we get rid of the layers of infection in the, in the blood supply or whatever we're doing, if we're, well, it's not even layers of infection, let's say that that shows clear within the blood supply and we are treating high cholesterol, then we would want to look at um, maybe doing a liver gallbladder flush first before we go towards um, you know, moving upstream, up the valley, if you will, up the canyon to cleanse and clear other areas. We want to make sure that the filtering system down in the valley, the sewer treatment plant, can handle that that uh, influx of toxins heading its its way. So I usually always look to checking vitality. And again, you can just ask the body. Let's just give me a zero. Give me a number from from zero to a hundred. What level are you in vitality? And then I proceed to ask: 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Okay, we're dropping on a 50. That would indicate. And I would just say I would suggest you out your vitality is about 50 percent. And they'll usually say, well, duh. I could have told you that, <laughs> but, but, but then I would ask, at 50%, can you handle die-off coming to the liver? Can, you handle, can the liver handle the processing? If we start to do some process procedures to drop that, the extra cholesterol, will it be able to handle it? Because oftentimes the, the body will put things away, that it'll, it'll warehouse it until it has the ability to, you know, to, to detox. That's a great question, Owen. But that's the same thinking. That thinking is what you're going to have to think about on any of your, of your, of your conditions that come your way. Where do I start first? Am I, am I going to get rid of the infection? Let's, let's just take leaky gut, for example. Do I go in and do a colonic the first day? Do I, do I open things up or remove biofilm and mucus plugs and stuff and, and uh, really open it up so now I've just made it even more leaky? Or do I give it cold tracks for a while and maybe some Adrenex to support the adrenal glands and get energy up, maybe work from hypothala and thyroidin, and getting the energy up first and then after the cold tracks has had some time to work and repair the colon tissue enough to where now I can go after the parasite. But if I'm knocking off parasites or fungus and I've still got an amazingly leaky gut, then I'm going to make that patient real sick and they're going to say, man, that dang guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So yeah, we just have to always ask. Great question. Thank you for that.